pyramid was designed as a veritable fortress to protect the pharaoh and his sacred texts, essential to the soul's survival in the beyond. During their excavations, archaeologists uncovered an ingenious system intended to repel any attempt at intrusions. Computer-based image analysis has confirmed the presence of harrows. A harrow is a dam system, often made of hard stone like granite. Granite was one of the hardest known rocks at that time. The harrow system weighed more than 14 tons, or the equivalent of three elephants. The architects had designed a passage with three granite harrows. These are granite walls, and just above are harrows that are raised up, but that should come down and block the passage for eternity. During construction, the harrows are held in place with the aid of stays. Once the pharaoh's grave is installed at the heart of the pyramid, the stays are withdrawn. The granite blocks then seal the corridor forever. It's impossible to drill through them. Yet the harrows didn't halt the progress of looters, the ones responsible for the destruction of the texts. Obviously, the thieves couldn't care less and went through the limestone walls from the outside. They made a detour around these granite walls. For researchers, working out how the looters got to the heart of the pyramid provided clues to the damage they caused. To revive the site, the archaeologists would rely on new tools at the cutting edge of technology. Before, we'd take a sheet of water paper and paint watercolors, etc. It'd freeze the idea, but no more. Today, we have new technologies like photogrammetry to support our imagination. Photogrammetry can turn thousands of photos into a 3D model. For the first time, researchers will use this method over 40 hectares. It's a technique that can throw up new clues and unearth the secrets of the reign of Pepi I and his dynasty. The surface that the archaeologists wish to model in 3D is gigantic. The only way to cover such an expanse is to take a step backwards and upwards. Up to more than 300 meters altitude to finally take in the whole of the site. The researchers called upon an archaeologist specialized in photogrammetric reconstruction, along with a drone pilot. We, we like to cover this kind of, of area. It's like 24 hectares at okay. 70 meters high. So it will be a resolution of about uh, two, uh, two centimeters. To achieve such a degree of precision, the drone will need to take thousands of snaps at a frantic rate. Every nook and cranny of the necropolis must be photographed. The drone will cover this surface, much like a farmer plowing his field, progressing steadily and taking photos at regular intervals. In order to obtain the best possible results, flights and photographs are entirely automated. Maybe on that area with a necropolis. After an initial sweep at 70 meters, the archaeologists decided to program a second. This time the drone will fly closer to the ground at an altitude of 30 meters to boost the precision. It'll carry on its way, and each time it moves like that, it'll take a photo. The photos will follow each other and have areas of overlap. This is how we create a digital model of the terrain, upon which we then reapply the photos to get an ortho image, rather like a satellite picture, but with much greater resolution. Because at this height, two centimeters equals one pixel, whereas Google is at around 50 centimeters per pixel. This technology will allow archaeologists to access images 25 times as precise as those available on the internet. 
To achieve this, every spot in the necropolis is photographed over 60 times in different ways. Computer processing then synthesizes all these photographs into just one. This image is an ortho image. It is totally flat with no deformation. The file obtained is an ultra high definition photograph containing 650 million pixels. In just one click, it can pass from an overall view to the close up of a pebble. The final stage is to assemble the thousands of photos, this time to form a three dimensional model. Photogrammetry has now made such huge progress in terms of both algorithms and computing power that once we have all the photos, we can inject them into a program, enter the parameters, and configure the software correctly to produce a model from these thousands of photos. So there are a few operations to do once you have a coherent set. Here, all the photos taken by the drone are materialized in space. The GPS coordinates, altitude, and shot angles of every snap are recorded. The necropolis is totally covered by 1,715 photos. An advanced algorithm analyzes these images and the 3D model begins to take shape. The photos are laid out with pinpoint accuracy. To be sure of their location, a final check is carried out using reference points known to the archaeologists. In fact, we placed around 20 targets on the ground. And now the exercise is to find these targets in the photos and log them. The software will then tag all photos with the right coordinates. What's this one? It's 101. So this is a target we put on one of the walls of the store and whose coordinates in space we know exactly. So now we log it manually with the software. Finally, the 3D model of the necropolis of Pepi I is taking shape. This modeling is a precious tool for archaeologists as they can now see the site from their computer in a completely new way. They can inspect every nook and cranny, take measurements and establish new theories about the history of the necropolis. In a single view, we have a map, a bird's eye view of all the excavations that have been carried out, or the areas still to be excavated. It's something quite extraordinary. A map cannot provide this detail. It means we can perhaps validate certain hypotheses and invalidate others. The three-dimensional modeling of the necropolis allows us to take measurements in just seconds an operation that would take hours on the ground. With the help of this precious data, it will soon be possible to redraw the necropolis in its original splendor, but also to create the digital model of humanity's largest collection of religious texts. Cristel Alvarez is part of the team. Her research focuses on a pyramid located south of the necropolis. The lengthy reconstruction of the texts begins. She scours the Egyptian desert relentlessly. The slightest fragment, however small, may be a key to understanding the sacred texts. Each stone is turned, analyzed back-breaking work under a blazing sun. You can pass a spot and not notice that there's a text because everything depends on the light. But early in the morning, when the light is low angled, the texts suddenly spring out. We can see a fragment that later we might miss under a strong light, like there is now. After a few hours of searching, three fragments appear. 
they will join the 576 elements already collected by the Egyptologist. These few square centimeters are a precious testimony of ancient Egypt. There could be a line from one of the columns, a bit of a sign. Maybe we'll find another piece that we can complete in the corner. And sometimes we may be surprised in one way or another. These fragments will eventually be returned to their original place. To achieve this, a meticulous classification process must take place. Work that the Egyptologists carry out in a secret place, a veritable fortress within which is part of humanity's oldest corpus of texts. We were granted exceptional access. This bank vault of history is referred to by archaeologists as the store. Here, every priceless fragment is ordered, classified and documented. It's like our archaeological treasure. This is where most of the work is actually done for the mission. It's watched over by police, by guards. Nobody is supposed to know where it is or have access. Among all these stones, 1,600 fragments come from a burial chamber to the west of Pepi I's pyramid. Though the vestiges are quite visible today, they were previously buried under five meters of sand. When Marie Noël Friss and her team arrived in 2007, they were unaware that under their feet was a pyramid. Little by little, an impressive number of fragments have resurfaced. At the time, we gathered maybe two or three hundred pieces, which was quite a lot. We were all pretty excited at the thought of finding a new one. And as we progressed in the study of these pieces, we ended up finding the name of the queen. It was Queen Behenu, a young queen at the time, totally unknown to Egyptologists. To find out more, the team organized a dig. <laughs> 120 men worked relentlessly, manually extracting thousands of cubic meters of sand. We saw a small piece of wall emerge from the sand, just the top. The rest was buried in the sand. That was good, as it showed us there were texts here, that we'd find walls still in good shape, still legible. The painting was impeccable. It was all painted green, but we could only see this much. Then as we went down, we realized a good part of the walls was intact, and that's irreplaceable when working on pyramid texts. If you have text in place at the bottom of the wall, it allows you place everything above. As we know what comes before and after, you can put together 90% of the wall like that, just by having a strip at the bottom that allows you to link it up. These are the remains of the Queen's tomb after six months excavation. In all, 1,600 fragments are collected and transported to the store. The Egyptologists are faced with a huge 60 square meter puzzle to piece together. The aim is to restore in just a few years what has been destroyed over several centuries. You can give them a thumbs up, just here. The outlines and inscriptions are drawn with great precision so as not to betray the words of the Egyptians from that time. The fact of working on them, drawing them, committing them to computer, then classifying them, reclassifying them, and reclassifying them differently means we gradually learn what they mean. After the stone blocks are traced, the drawings are scanned and copied onto computer. Painstaking work for the epigraphists. Each stroke, each curve, is meticulously executed. 
They thus convert hieroglyphics engraved in the rock 4,300 years ago into vector graphics. These files are 2,500 times smaller than a photo. A vector drawing weighs nothing. They're mathematical formulae, not pixels, so the file is tiny. And when you come to walls that are 6, 7, 8 meters long by 3 meters, 50 tall, we need lightweight files because otherwise we couldn't handle anything. Each digitized item has a technical card which contains all block information, size, origin, as well as the content of their inscriptions. We have keywords. If ever we try to reconstruct a swamp scene, we have a keyword, swamp. So if we just enter swamp in the database, it throws up all blocks linked to this type of scenery. It's an essential work tool for us. This database provides precious help to Egyptologists, as only the human brain can manage to put together the thousands of pieces of the puzzle. We don't yet have a computer system that can do the job itself. Only the human mind can remember that such and such a sign or word is found in such a spell, which allows us to find roughly the location of this text. Impossible to know exactly the text that should appear on the walls. But by analogy with the inscriptions of the other pyramids, the Egyptologists managed to define the plans of the walls as they must have been at the time. Here is a part of the fragments virtually restored. On the north wall, shown here, almost 99% of the stones found could be replaced on a computer. We must now return them physically to Queen Benhu's burial chamber. <laughs>